But the early years weren't all Eddie and Ingve. One of the other things I spent a lot of time listening to was David Lee Roth's album, Eat Em and Smile. This was the band he put together after leaving Van Halen, and it featured Steve Vai on guitar. Educated at Berkeley College of Music and an alumnus of Frank Zappa's band, Steve's style was at once quirky and intense. Steve shared Eddie's subversive penchant for irreverent sounds and effects. And his playing was rooted in the kind of slick pentatonic blues that Eddie had helped install as the default for 80s rock. And Steve was also a highly capable tapper, elaborating Eddie's technique to paint swirling, space-age designs across the strings. Although picking didn't dominate Steve's sound the way it did Ingve's, his impeccable command of it was more than evident. On songs like Tobacco Road, he crisscrossed the neck with blistering minor scale runs whose precision and clarity was simply frightening. Assuming, as he did, Eddie's nearly sanctified role alongside David Lee Roth, expectations of a guitar showdown were palpably high. But the truth is, Van Halen themselves had already gone soft. On 5150, the album they released after Roth, they sported fashion mullets and shoulder-padded blazers and penned treacly synthesizer ballads. They posed barefoot in Club Med-approved beach attire and performed in cotton pastels that were less Sunset Strip than they were Tequila Sunrise. By contrast, Steve's jet black glare, arachnoid fingers, and pallid, consumptive appearance were downright evil. He had this habit of running right up to the camera and shoving the guitar in your face like he was trying to prove something. This swagger was put to utterly fitting use in the guitar-themed Faustian fable, Crossroads, for which Steve was tapped to portray the devil's henchman, Jack Butler. Now, what was so scary about this is how unvarnished and in-your-face the playing is in this lick. Most guitar players at the time would preface their speed lick with some type of ornament, like a slide up the neck. Or maybe some legato playing. Or you would do some tremolo picking to get the pick moving up to speed before you would do the articulate stuff. But Steve has no time for any of that. There's not even any music playing, it's just the sound of people clapping. He goes from dead silence to total speed picking intimidation. In zero seconds flat. He even takes off his jacket to do it, like you know what's coming. The whole guitar duel is over even before it starts. Steve's incredible playing and diabolical performance practically certified him as a kind of musical enforcer. If Dave was out to prove there was life after Van Halen, he had assembled the right band of assassins for the job. Fiery and dangerous, they were just like Van Halen themselves had been a decade earlier. thoroughly evolved blend of every current playing technique and his high media profile made him the most visible archetype of the technically erudite modern guitarist. Backed by the superlative songwriting he displayed on Eat Em and Smile, he was everything guitar players would have wanted from Eddie himself. I quickly set the SK-1 to work and learned as many of the licks on the album as I could. Around that time, I also picked up a copy of Guitar Player Magazine, which came with one of those floppy 45 RPM records they used to include before CDs became popular. It was some guy named Albert Lee. The accompanying article said he had played with Emmy Lou Harris and the Everly Brothers, both of whom I knew because my dad liked them. But it was free, so with low expectations, I dropped it on the turntable. <laughs>
proceeded to be completely blown away. The song was called Fun Ranch Frolics, which came to be known on later Albert Lee albums as Fun Ranch Boogie. It wasn't scales, it wasn't arpeggios, in fact, it wasn't even metal. It was country. And played with a clean guitar tone, which every 80s metal player avoided because the hammer-on and pull-off techniques didn't really sound as impressive without distortion pedals. To sound as authoritative with a clean tone as you did with distortion, you really had to be a confident picker. And that's exactly what Albert was. Every note of Fun Ranch was picked crystal clear, just like Ingbe, with that incredibly funky sense of rhythm that only country guys have. The performance overflowed with character, with cool tricks like bends, slides and open strings that really enhanced the country vibe. The magazine ran a transcription of Fun Ranch alongside an interview with Albert. It was mostly two note per string fingerings, like blues, but skittering by at impossible speeds in a kind of controlled chaos like Keystone Cops. This was a fascinating new kind of virtuosity and I quickly wrangled some Fun Ranch licks. But Albert wasn't the only guy doing fast, two-note-per-string picking. Later on in high school, the kid down the block taped a show off Channel 13 with a player he wanted me to hear. Holy crap! If Albert was the Eddie Van Halen of country, then Eric Johnson was the Yngwie. The TV show was called Austin City Limits. It was a respected live music show from Texas. A place which I knew from school was west of Long Island. The player on the tape was also not from Long Island. In his name was Eric Johnson. Eric's right hand was utterly flawless, and his lyrical, flowing phrases seemed to connect the instrument's lowest registers with its highest ones in the same sort of effortless way that Ingve did. And like Ingve, these simultaneously ethereal and intimidating licks were played on a classic Stratocaster, devoid of white and black stripes, tiger print, or Asian-themed graphics. In the flash-obsessed 80s, this was the musical equivalent of driving around in a hot-rodded Chevelle with flat black primer. Eric's dedication to this purest aesthetic extended to every element of his sound. He was known as much for his playing as for his smooth, almost violin-like guitar tone. Which he achieved by obsessively refining specific combinations of effects and vintage amplifiers. A rumor even circulated at the time that Eric could audibly distinguish different brands of batteries in his effect pedals. The stories of Eric's single-minded focus on music and tone, combined with his repudiation of mainstream flash, only enhanced his image as a kind of impossibly skilled guitar frontiersman. throwback to a time when people made their own candles and churned their own butter. That he could back this up with deadly and seemingly effortless technique just made the rest of us feel like suburban milk toasts. No doubt about it, this tag team of triple intimidation was no coincidence. I could understand if it was just Ingve or even just metal players, but my trio of tormentors came from three totally different worlds. First, I thought I couldn't play rock. But now I knew 
it was actually much worse. Other musical styles were just as filled with things I couldn't do. They might have seemed harmless enough, but the truth was definitely grisly. I was trapped, and I needed a way out.